have you here tonight. Great, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you for the invitation, this opportunity to talk to this very uh, broad depths of the background in different audience um, and, and people in this meeting. So I'm trying to um, think of when I give this presentation, I get used to give uh, presentations to a very scientific community. So I have a lot of technical details in the slides, but you can ignore them. I want to make this more interactive and I'm very open to your questions if you do have during the middle of my presentation, okay? So the title for my presentation today is Maximizing the Fungal Potential for Bioremediation. And from the mouthful introduction of my background, you can say I'm not a mycologist. My background is in chemistry. And I did a lot of in environmental related chemistry work. And that's one of the major reasons to drive me toward this direction when I came back to Texas A&M and working as a faculty here to conduct my research project. So I'll explain to you why, why I pick fungus. And in terms of bioremediation, the very general speaking uh, of introduction is it's a utilization of biological systems to remove environmental contaminants and pollutants from different environmental matrices such as air, water, soil, and other things you can think of. And very common to people's mind that microbes that can be used for bioremediation purpose, including includes bacteria, fungus, and microalgae, et cetera. And I also want to remind you, plants can also be used for bioremediation, and those are higher like uh, organisms. So part of my research is using fungus, and I have another research direction that will combine different other platforms for, bio, for remediation. But then in terms of bioorganisms, why do I choose fungus? And I want to approach this question from different perspectives. So the first one is uh, the capacity for fungus compared with other organisms. Fungi possess the biochemical and ecological capacity to degrade a lot of broader spectrum environmental chemicals. And they also co-metabolize those different chemicals when they are using different nutrient source. So pay attention to the co-metabolism and that's actually one of the fundamental mechanisms we use in one of my rec recent research projects. And also fungus are very tough. They can live in very harsh environment conditions. Their spores can stay long, even though the weather is very hot, there's very little water. Unlike bacteria, they can live on the more diverse conditions compared with bacteria. They have to live together with water and uh, available nutrients. And fungi can interact with different things in the environment, such as metals, even radionuclides. And those different pollutants can be mobilized and immobilized when uh, interacting with fungus. So this gives a very unique opportunity when fungi can apply in different conditions and on a different uh, tough or, or easygoing environment. It's also very advantageous to uh, in situations such that you can translocate very essential factors such as nutrients and water and the pollutant together. So when uh, the fungus is living in the, in, the, in the environment, it's metabolizing and it's, it's making through its whole life cycle. It can, trans, can biotransform or detoxify those chemicals when it's in its life cycle. And compared with bacteria, fungi sometimes have a better capacity to degrade a very persistent chemical, such as dioxin, one of the human-made or man-made toxics uh, about the top toxicity in the environment together with like TNT and other um, organics like we use a lot in our routine life. The, the, the medication we take, the animal feed that also use veterinary drugs and we treat our pets together with many other chemicals such as environmental phenols, and they widely present in our environment, in water, in the soil, currently to this century. So when we talk about a fungi as a organism, fungus can also produce proteins and they can be used alone as a machinery to decompose different chemicals. The application of that has been widely witnessed in different research groups that people only use biochemistry methods 
that a protein, which is a biocatalyst or enzyme that can decompose different chemicals. And another very good advantage, even though it's hardly really realized in many commercial platforms, is the potential of a passive treatment system that we can lower potentially lower the cost for those environmental remediation uh, in terms of a large um, scheme. It's a natural attenuation. So in this case, if it can be conducting the field, then uh, people expect and estimate the cost will be much lower than uh, the current mechanical approach for remediation. Okay, so we love it as I introduced to you for advantages of using fungi as a bioremediation vehicle. However, there are a lot of challenges associated with a broad and real life application for using fungus, such that selection of the right species is very difficult. And many of you may know that um, up to now, based on the molecular tools we can use for identification of fungus, a very um, rough estimation of the biodiversity in this, um, in this kingdom can amounts to from 2.8 million to more than 3 million fungal species on our planet. And to this day, only less than 150,000 species has been described. And then uh, a lot of us know some of the fungi are plant pathogens and uh, on the order of hundreds of that are human pathogens. But Compare with the total estimate of the biodiversity species number, we know so little about a fungus on our planet. So which one came the best for the job we wanted to do is a tough question to ask. And also, uh, even though we know fungi can decompose a lot of things, in terms of the people understanding of toxicity and even the chemicals we made, it's still very inclusive for us to make a conclusion that the degraded products or the metabolites produced from the parent chemical is less toxic or is more toxic. So there are a lot of uncertainty associated with those degradation pathways of the pollutants. And also there is hardly a one fits for all platform that can be broadly used in, in, in the current technology. And as I mentioned, we love the cost associated with the estimate it can be low cost, it's a passive same, but it can also be very slow. As if you watch for the fungus to grow on the dead woods, they can exist there for a long time, but the woods can also last for a long time. Of course, we love the mushrooms after the rain, they boom just overnight. But in terms of decomposition, it's a natural process, it takes time. Okay. So talking about a fungi, it's one of my recent research uh, directions. I also want to use this slide to give a very general introduction of all the other projects I do in my lab. So bioremediation is a large aspect of my research interest. Of course, fungal bioremediation is a, a, a very um, new direction in my lab. Then uh, besides using fungi, to do bioremediation, my lab also incorporates electro bioremediation that we use bacteria in the more liquid phase to study, understand how we can improve the degradation efficiency. And we also develop different tools such that we use chemistry and the social catalysis that we look into making new forms of material that can, that can absorb and decompose uh, pollutants uh, simultaneously. Then another research direction in my lab, we're also looking into carbon dioxide ma management. Then uh, as I mentioned, electrocatalysis is one research direction in my lab. So we use that for CO2 reduction and combination with uh, bacterial fermentation to converting CO2 into different diversified uh, compounds. And then we also use microalgae in the way when I talk about bioremediation, that we use microalgae to harness uh, CO2 through photosynthesis that we can use that to produce different useful chemical commodity groups. And then uh, as in the introduction, I'm trained to be a chemist. So right now we're doing different surveillance project that we try to understand how those different contaminants can potentially uh, exist in human body that we're doing exposure assessment in the population. So come back to fungus. And I'm very excited when I started this collaboration with uh, um, one of uh, the 
best groups in this world for the fungal connection. So I'm currently working with USDA, the forest products laboratory that we are studying together and to screen species of fungi that can be very useful to decompose a broad scope of chemicals such as organic dye, such as PFAS, which is a compound I'm going to introduce later, and such as pharmaceutical compounds that can be easily di disposed by human being and just dump into the, your, your trash can and also flush them in, into toilet. So those are actually emerging contaminants in our environment and how we're looking to look for a right species from the fung fungi kingdom that we can use its bioremediation capacity. So working with this uh, lab at this moment, we have kind of handpicked hundreds of species we want to screen. And this map shows you the distribution of species we have collected and picked into this library. The bigger dots shows that we have more species collected in that state. So because this is a collaboration with the Wisconsin lab, there's no doubt you see more species are collected in Wisconsin. And when I first started this project, actually it was uh, in the beginning of the COVID. And then uh, uh, don't, don't, don't look at the Texas map in this map. I have isolates from Texas, but it's not currently in this um, screening data when I'm going to present to you for this analysis. So this is a very brief kind of a summary of the about 320 species or isolates actually we have screened. So sometimes we have more isolates in the same species, but we have less. It depends on the, the, the library availability from our collaborator from the USDA lab. So I will just talk to you very briefly for how we use this plate assay as a quick and the rapid screening tool, we can pick out fungus isolates of our interest. So what we do is we pour an agar plate and we put an organic dye, which is in red color in this case, and we wait it for, um, for the plate to cool down. Then we inoculate a small piece of fungus onto the plate. Then we incubate this plate at the temperature of 30 degrees. And then we watch for the growth of the fungal mycelium. And then we watch out for the decoring capacity of this plate. So you can see I have number from one, two, three, four, and five. That's a way for us to rank of our capacity. So you can see in the last plate here, apparently given the fixed time evaluation period, this particular isolate was able to grow to the four plates. And then I compare with this number five, that's the highest rank. You can see in plate one, which is actually not growing anything. I mean, apparently stay at, it, at its original form. Then uh, two and three, you can see it's more kind of artificial of the measurement. But again, because we're working with hundreds of the isolates, we regard this is a more fast screening method we can adopt in the lab. So this is kind of a, a, a comparison again on the cartoon image. So we can measure what's the diameter of the growing of that circle in, on the plate. And this is a way for us to rank the capacity of how fast the fungi can grow and how fast the fungi can change the color of the plate. So this is a very quick uh, summary of the species uh, as we have those through hundreds, actually to this moment, 320 isolates in our screening, that we're looking into what are the species compared with other ones are more likely to have decomposers or degraders in the experiment condition we have performed. And I want to remind you that because fungus can grow in very different environments and we don't think the only condition we tested might be the best condition for all the fungi isolates we have used in this screening study. So there is a danger for us to miss very good decomposers because our screening condition might not be the best. But again, we have to compromise of missing opportunity versus the throughput of what we can do to go through plates and plates and plates and identify a good species for our study. 
So, uh, so far in our identification screening, we regard uh, trematase vesicolor is one of the top species. If we pick one from this species, then the more likelihood we can have, it can grow fast. It can decolor the plate faster than other ones. And we have outliers for sure. For, for example, in, in other groups, we may see a faster grower. And for other groups, we may see one that can decolor the plate very quickly. But on average, among the species, among the isolates we have tested, so far, trimetase vesicolor give us the best uh, possibility of being able to pick one that's a faster grower together with as a faster degrader. Okay. So then go back to this screening. Why do we want to use organic dye as a compound to screen for a useful species in terms of future bioremediation application. So this traces back to actually more than um, seven, eight years ago. So at that time, I'm doing collaboration with another faculty in our department that uh, he is an expert in utilizing lignin, which is one component of the cell wall. So at that time, we just did one very quick study that we have a fungus. We didn't even go through for screening for more powerful ones, but we know it's a good decomposer. And uh, what we did is we put an organic dye solution and we add some lignin together. So the theory behind it is that we know lignin is a component, component of cell wall. And cell wall for plants are natural food for fungus. That's what Andrew talked about, the mushroom outreach and teach people how to use, how to grow mushroom. And those very effective substrates for mushrooms in other terms, fungi, can be a promoter for those organisms to produce the effective vehicle in their biological system. In this case, we hypothesize are useful enzymes produced by fungus to deal with those environmental pollutants as a co-metabolism. So what we did observe in this experiment, if you only have the dye solution, you cultivate your fungus. And if you only have lignin, you grow your fungus. But you have a combination, then in this combination, the fungus can degrade the dye molecule, or in other words, in a simple judgment process, that the color defeated much faster than the dye solution by itself. So of course, at that time, we studied this uh, fungus, and we also try to understand what could be the the workhorse, what's the hero in that study? So we were able to look into potential proteins the fungus produced to deal with this uh, organic dye. And that's also the foundation for the current screening assay we designed together with the other study I'm going to introduce a little bit later. So I also want to give you, of, uh, in the ideal world, I show you the cartoon image. You just draw a circle, you say five of that centimeter diameter, the fungus grow to the four plate. But in reality, when you do the experiment, the fungus has personalities. So this is the same plate I'm showing you that you may have a different measurement depending on who is doing that measurement. But generally speaking, I think the variety here is within the observation error. So this is one that's a, a faster grower in our screening assay. And I can show you this another one that's a little bit slower. And you can see the diameter actually vary a little bit, but within the standard deviation of centi one centimeter. So this shows you the robustness of our screening assay for us to pick one that grows fast and pick one that can decolor the plate as rapidly as it can. So just uh, some very general uh, observation from this screening assay is we do say a huge diversity of different fungal isolates, even within the same species. And of course, we have also collected different, my collaborators have collected different species from different locations. There's no doubt you can say, if they're the same species, if they're collected in Wisconsin versus New Jersey, they may have different behavior or prototype in our study. And then we say faster growers versus those slower growers, but I want also to remind you, it's not necessary to say somebody grow fast. It's going to decolor the plate faster. Now we see a kind of correlation. 
And in the purpose of this screening assay, we want somebody to grow fast, and it can also decolor the plate fast. And those are the species we are going to work further to look into other capacities. So one thing is now we know in our screening assay, and I can tell you, we usually use like seven days as our markdown day. Say, I'm going to stop the experiment. If this fungus isolate will grow slower than seven days, I'm not going to even look at in the purpose of doing bioremediation, which could be a wrong hypothesis, because I want to assure you, in our study, we see some very slow growers, but their decolorization capacity is very good. What's the indication for that? So this potentially tells us this fungus grow very slowly. Maybe the condition we use is not optimal. However, this fungus may be able to produce very powerful enzymes that can be harnessed independently of this biological system, but in a biochemistry system. Okay. And uh, what are the other observations and also uh, concerns when we're doing this screening assay? Is so now we have this dye molecule on a plate. It's widely available to the fungus when it's growing outside, right? However, in the environment, your contaminant accessibility might be very dependent on the matrix you are dealing with. And then in the real environment, because we're trying to look into different chemical groups, as I mentioned to you, dioxin is very toxic. As I mentioned to you, TNT is a total different chemical. And the drugs, medications, are the phenols which have different impacts on the ecosystem, potentially have different toxicity on the fungus too. So how fungi can tolerate those different chemicals is another different story. And then in the ideal environment performed in the lab, we have a beautiful culture. We give it nutrients that the fungus needs and then we know what condition this particular isolate can grow well. However, when we're applying that in the environment, you have to consider many other harsh conditions. So how you can sustain your fungal culture in the real treatment condition is another very important question to ask. So with all those understandings in the, in, in the background, so now we're moving to a more important question we want to ask. We know fungus has this property and capacity. They live wildly in the nature. They can do things, do amazing things, decompose chemicals if we study them. And we know they grow very slowly. So how can we improve this efficiency? And I'm going to combine this uh, question together with a very kind of uh, interesting and hot topic right now in the environmental field that we are study a group of chemicals we call that PFAS. So what are the, this group of the chemicals? The full name for that is still a uh, very mouthful, per and polyfluoro alcohol substances. And uh, this is a, a group of uh, man-made chemicals starting from last century. They have been actually broadly used because we love the chemistry behind those uh, composition. They can be used as water and grease repellents. And they are very stable. We designed them to be stable because we want them to be stable in the environment. So we can use them toward our purpose for application. So they got this name called that forever chemicals because they're so stable due to the, the chemical bond we made in those chemicals. So if you look at the bottom of the structure, you have carbon together with fluorine. And this is one of the strongest chemical bond you can form from the, from the elementary table, periodic table. And they can stay in the environment for a very long time, not only in the water, in the matrices such as soil and other uh, containers, it can exist in our body and not go away easily. And they are pollutants, actually. They can be discovered even in the drinking water system currently in our country. So a lot of different materials already containing this group of chemicals. And two of the most well-studied, including PFOA and PFOS. So those are eight carbon molecules. I just showed the structure in the previous slide. They can exist in carpet and flooring. People have used them as like um, texture uh, uh, mix mixers. And also people use that for clothing, for the packaging. And uh, one of the very um, controversial usage 
of PFAS is in firefighting foams, which leads to a lot of contamination in the firefighting training sites and many other industry sources because there is a lot of chemistry and property of those group of chemicals so much. So people know a lot about PFOA and PFOS. So those two actually have been gradually phased out because we know they're very bad for the uh, human health. Newer PFAS compounds are, are manufactured as replacement, but their health impacts are largely unknown. I don't want to scare you saying, hey, we have all those very toxic chemicals in the environment, what can I do? And I can tell you, up to now, more than 9,000 PFAS compounds has been manufactured to our knowledge. So we have an inventory, and we know where they have been used toward because we know their function. And more research needs to be done to understand the toxicity, of course. And uh, CDC, as the surveillance and the public health agency in our country, they have studied some population exposure study back from the 2000s. So this data shows you the monitoring of the presence of a group of PFAS molecules in the human body. That's what I'm saying. Hey, don't be panic. We know it's there and we know it's in our body, but we look at the risk factor and what can be the potential issue in our routine life, then we can have a better handle of it. Actually, can clearly say from the 2000s up to 2018, there is a decline of PFOS, which is a C8, carbon-8 molecule, due to the phase out of this chemical. But some other compounds stay kind of more at a stable concentration in the, in the general population in our country. So I want to use this figure to show you there are more risks in certain population compared with the general population from the more targeted study. So for example, in manufacturing workers, the PFOA exposure is kind of more significant than the US general population. So the blue bar here in the middle is kind of the measurement of the US population uh, around 2000. The bottom blue bar here shows you the surveillance of the CDC population study that we have a significant decreased population mm. exposure in terms of PFOA in, in human bodies. But you can say for manufacturers and many other higher risk groups, they probably have a higher risk of exposed to, to those chemicals. But nevertheless, we know those PFAS compounds are, are controversial in terms of the application and in, their, in terms of the environmental impacts. So what we are trying to do in my research is we're thinking of this idea. Now we know fungi can decompose different things in the environment. And we know fungi love plants because that's their food. Like we love sugar, <laughs> we love candy, we love good food. Fungus does the same. And then uh, if we can come up with an idea if we can design a sorbent, it's plant-based material. And this sorbent can absorb those pollutants such as PFAS. Then we give this as a food to fungus. What's going to be the outcome? Then uh, in this scenario, what we hypothesize, the fungi should be able to eat it up. Like while it's eating up the natural food as a plant-based material. And the reason for me to come to this idea is understanding that PFAS is a long standing problem. It's very stable and people have done a lot to, to kind of extract PFAS from different environmental matrices. In the enriched form, currently the only commercial platform to destroy those enriched PFAS is through temperature, heating it up, incineration, which is not sustainable and very expensive. So what we hope is design a passive system that we can use plant-based material as a sorbent to absorb PFAS. And then we give this heavily contaminated food to fungus to say if fungi can deal with it or not. So that's the basic idea behind this project. We're hoping to design an efficient bioremediation framework. So in this framework, not only fungi is the, the body that's doing the job, the material itself is another kind of component of the pilot, which is an absorbent that can enrich the chemical and which also serve as a substrate for the fungi to eat as a food. 
So in order to understand that, I have to explain a little bit to you of the plant, water, uh, plant cell wall composition and then why we pick those important components to design our sorbent system. So the natural substance for right water fungus, when you walk out into the park and you look at all those things grow on the wood, many of those belong to the right water fungus. So the cell wall, the three major components plus some other minor components are lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. So I won't go too deep into the chemistry and the composition of plant cell wall, but that's our starting material for when us try to design this sorbent and framework that a fungus can eat as food. So we started with speaking lignin. That's uh, the, the substance we added about 80 years ago when we were trying to treat the liquid media, that's the red color dye solution. And then uh, we also use cellulose, which is a component we engineer to give the framework that we don't create a powder. What we need is like something like a plant has three, three, three dimensional structure that the fungus can grow. And then uh, after this material is made, we treat this material with PFAS contaminated solution. And then we inoculate the fungus of our interest. So we call this is a reverse engineering principle because number one, we design a sorbent based on what we know about plant cell wall. And number two, we design it because we hope to use this as a plant cell wall for fungus to grow. So we call this uh, system RAPIMA, Renewable Artificial Plant for in situ microbial environmental remediation. So on the picture here on the right, let me move my uh, screen of my picture. So I'm trying to show you that we have tested, we call RAPIMA, our final product, and compare with different controls we designed in, in the experiment to see how well my material can absorb PFAS chemical. So I want to be honest with you in our designing. When we compare RAPIMA with lignin powder, that's another component we designed, Lignin powder actually has a better adsorption capacity for PFAS in our experiment. That's the top blue line here in the figure. However, why we don't use lignin powder? Because if we only use lignin powder, the fungus cannot grow. What we need is an optimization that it's a plant cell wall, it's a nutrient for fungus. The fungus will grow happily on top of it. That's our hope. Then when it's happy living, it can metabolize the other pollutants that has been absorbed onto this material. So not going into the physics and how the modeling fits and far to understanding the, the binding affinity of our materials, the chemical, but basically we have done a lot of testing to, to understand the, the, the binding capacity. So a little bit of chemistry behind it. Again, it's not a quiz question or an exam question, but I want to explain to you what we did with different components from the cell wall. So lignin, as I mentioned, one of the favorites or the substrates that promote fungus to secrete or produce those powerful proteins to do its remediation or decomposition job. Then we modify lignin with certain chemistry, make this lignin with a function group that it can be interacting with PFAS molecule. Then we give lignin a home. We cannot fabricate cellulose into a nanostructure, it gives a lot of surface area that lignin can mix together and form this three-dimensional structure. So it's really kind of fluffy, a foam we have made. Then we have water go through the foam and then we inoculate fungus onto the foam. So eventually the fungus will be growing on top or in the middle or whatever the, the fungus can survive in that rapid material, that's our framework or so-called system for this bioremediation work. So again, in this figure, I show you the species we picked is, is Ipress lactius. So I also want to be honest, it's not the top species we have screened in our library study, but it is one of the uh, screened or ranked top ones in the library study that Ipress lactius is a powerful degrader in our dye screening assay. 
Okay, I don't want to bore you of those characterization for this material, but what I want to show you is those different colors suggest what's the interaction mechanism of how we absorb the pollutants by this material. So basically, as I mentioned to you, PFAS, this man-made molecule contain a lot of fluorine. So this characterization is taking advantage of the different color of fluorine to understand where my pollutant goes onto the surface or to the middle or to the bottom of my material. So this shows our chemical modification it worked very well to catch up the PFAS molecule from the polluted water. And the purple color show exactly overlapping with the nitrogen, which is a chemistry we introduce into lignin or rapimer as our material. So we see a tight interaction of our target with our modification of this artificial plant material. All right, so we have this material, I have to show that a fungi can grow on top of it. So I also want to be honest with you, with this species we picked, as we studied that species long time ago, we know it can degrade that molecule. We know when you, you we add lignin, then the decomposing capacity is significantly enhanced. However, when we threw this fungi, fungus into the liquid media of PFAS, it cannot even survive for more than 10 ppb of the PFOA solution we spiked. What does that mean? This PFAS molecule is very toxic. So if I have a liquid media, which is kind of dispersed with the very trace concentration, PPB means parts per billion. It's a very diluted solution. The fungus cannot even survive in that liquid media. However, when we design this material, we treated heavily contaminated PFAS water and we soaked up by this foam, then we inoculate our fungus. We find out our fungus can grow on top of it. So the picture here on the left bottom is a microscope image showing you that the, the fungi is growing on top of that uh, PF, uh, rapima material we have made, which has been soaked up by a lot of PFAS molecules into that material. So imagine if you have a sponge, the sponge is saturated with those pollutants and now your fungus come and grow on top of that sponge, okay? Of course, in order to publish our paper, we have to do more in-depth study to understand what's the concentration our, our rapima foam can absorb and to what concentration the fungus is no longer tolerant. But compared with a pure liquid media, that we're very, very happy to say the fungus can grow in the rapima system we just designed. So a lot of other kind of very heavy academic uh, terms. What we did is we also try to understand what's the molecular mechanism behind those, um, those dramatic like change of the fungi behavior. So on the picture here on the left, again, we purposely blackened the background because if it's white, you cannot clearly see that the fungus is growing on top of the wrapping form we have, we have engineered. So the black is at the control. And then the, the, the top row on the right is the rapima that sustain the fungus growth. Then on the bottom, actually, the less fungus grow. So one is a cellulose by itself, and the other one is another com composite we made, but not as effective as rapima. So on the right shows you, we try to un understand what are the enzymes or the proteins that the fungus try to survive in the system. And then they're doing the amazing job of decomposing rapima together with PFAS. All right, some ongoing study, as I mentioned, this is kind of a new research direction my lab just established. And we are very curious to see how we can even better improve the efficiency of this framework, so-called that sorbent degradation and nutrient for the fungus to grow come up together. What we hope is we can identify a very effective enzyme that we can separately incorporate in the system to improve the degradation efficiency. Okay, so right now we're studying how we can incorporate proteins into this uh, framework that we call Rapimo. And a very quick summary is we have designed a prototype that a plant-based material can absorb PFAS. Together, we can fit this nutrient or pollutant to fungi, and that fungi can grow on top of it at the same time to decompose the, the carbon source 
as lignin together with cellulose and co-metabolite or detoxify PFAS molecule. And in this particular case, we find IFAS lactis. This particular strain can degrade rapima, and we are trying to understand what are the most powerful enzymes this fungi fungus has used to decompose both the carbon source together with, with PFAS. So we hope to harness this mechanism and look into more species that can be powerful in terms of this remediation in, in real life in the future. So um, again, I hope to give you one story that we learned in our study and uh, I, using this as an opportunity to interact with you. And there are a lot of people worked on this project. And when I talk to you, it sounds like, okay, 320 isolates, um, it's a screening. So we'll put on the plates, but need multiple hands to grow them, to measure them and to repeat the experiment together with all those uh, PFAS measurements, together with the fungal characterization, it's a lot of work. So I want to also thank my collaborator from USDA, that Mark is a wonderful collaborator, and he knows a lot more about those species and, and, and mycology. And my collaborator, Joshua Yuan, who uh, was that kind of uh, lignin uh, guy, started the lignin study, then we communicated and we found out, hey, this is a, a actually pretty, interesting uh, collaboration that we can create something for the fungus to eat. And let's see what's going to happen. And also I want to acknowledge that AgriLife research that um, uh, the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology, my ho home department, together with NIHS, who funded us for this uh, amazing work uh, by expanding and uh, increasing or enhance the capacity for fungus to do remediation um, in different systems. Again, I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, so yeah, there were a few questions during um, the chat, during the talk that I can go back to, and some were more comments, and I may ask you to unmute and, and share your thoughts as well. Um, so yeah, so Heskin asks, would there be any health detriments to the plant as a result of having this high absorptive property. That's a very uh, interesting, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I just wanna say my name's not ask, actually that name, that was for a different meeting. <laughs> my name is Royce. Um, I was mainly wondering about the nano, sorry, don't mind the cat. I was mainly wondering about the uh, nano mesh structure and if having that in the on the cell wall of the plant would interfere with this ability to like fend off predators or to like fight off infections, uh, resist in environmental damage. And if it does impact the plant's health, if a plant would still be capable of growing up enough to collect a considerable amount of pollutants. So actually that's a, that's a different question because we call that artificial plant is no longer a living plant. Basically we have uh, decompose the plant, and then we re-engineer something that's like a plant, but it cannot grow anymore. But to answer your question, because uh, as I mentioned in the very first slide, people have been trying to use like plants for mediation purposes. So for example, people have grown plants in the arsenic contaminated field, and which sometimes people even know like rice is one of the crops that's prone to contamination of arsenic because it absorbs arsenic from water. And I would like to say um, plants are potentially more resistant to PFAS. I mean, using PFAS as an example, compared with maybe fungus in the liquid media and the bacteria, they can even hardly, many of the bacteria can even hardly survive because it's just so toxic. But um, like my colleagues have studied using Herbidopsis as a model plant to say, hey, if Arabidopsis can, can absorb PFAS. Where did it go? It's stay in the stem or in the leaves and stuff like that. So again, I think PFAS has a more detrimental health impact on, on animals and a human being. And people may not die immediately from exposed to it. It's more kind of chronic or like um, other diseases like cancer and, uh, and immune system damage. But it won't be very immediate until like people just uh, perform like suicide or something like that. I hope this answers your question. That, that did help very much. Thank you. Okay. And Nicole kind of added on to that. Nicole, do you want to unmute and 
share your thoughts and questions. Um, I was just thinking from the little bit I know, or from what I understood from the lecture, that if we can get the plants to take up a lot of the toxins in the environment, then worst case scenario, the fungi will eat some of the plant and then kind of reach its toxic load and die out. And then we could either reintroduce fresh fungi or just remove those plants and find some other way to recycle the material or something else to keep breaking them down. That's a very logical flow of your thinking, and I agree with you. So ideally, what we what we hope is the material be gone because uh, we mm -hmm. try to design a material that's cheap enough or inexpensive. Again, once you re-engineer, it's more expensive than plant itself, right? Because plant grow by itself. <laughs> Only you need to do is fertilize that. But this reverse engineering will be more expensive than a, a, a real plant. So that's number one. But number two, if this approach is inexpensive enough. So we compare this process with another existing process that you, you either use active carbon. I know some people know what active carbon means. That's an adorbent we use a lot. Or some other kind of commercial resins where people use to design for PFAS. So to that step is only step one. Now you have an enriched PFAS material. Then people send it out for incarceration. incarceration you just burn it up. But in our system here, if the adorbent absorb that PFAS, so now we just stream into a bioreactor together with PFAS and fungus, then it grows. It's passive. I don't need to do anything. Then uh, eventually the toxin will be eliminated and the, 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 the plant is decomposed and the fungus eat it up. So we hope to produce something much less toxic than the original PFOA or PFOA are the kind of toxic parent molecules. And that's the theory or the hypothesis behind it. You're exactly right. Eventually it's going to be decomposed. Okay. Uh, so Jim, he asked about glyphosates. Um, and from what I know, I don't believe they're a PFOA. Yeah. Glyphosate is a different chemical. Actually, um, glyphosate is a very broadly used uh, uh, pesticide and uh, actually a herbicide in, in our country. And uh, um, it, there's a different perspective versus those pesticides and PFAS. PFAS is more kind of industry chemical and glyphosate and maybe even new neonicotinoids and other, other pesticides in the agriculture. We more regard as agriculture <laughs> chemicals. Both are emerging contaminants potentially in drinking water but then in the environment, glyphosate, I think it ha has a different impact on the ecosystem than PFAS. People are really concerned about those like flooring molecules. And those are, are one of the primary reasons for PFAS to be so toxic. So I, I would not to say PFAS is more toxic than glyphosate. They have different like phenotypes in terms of toxicity. But again, PFAS is a totally different group of chemical. It has to have a lot of carbon flooring bond, but glyphosate has a totally different structure. It's a, a herbicide. Okay, Colton, do you wanna ask your question? Hi, yeah, I was, um, I was wondering if there's any research being done with uh, like using algae to address PFAS or other um, other contaminants in natural waterways, um, like if these contaminants are suspended in water already, as opposed to maybe being in solid substrates, um, how that could be uh, addressed. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, thought, because you're from Iowa, howdy. <laughs> I have been living out for three years, um, back from 2016 to 2019. So I don't think there are a lot of study to understand the adorbents of PFAS in those natural system. And I think the number one reason is people are more concerned about in the liquid phase, uh, what's the concentration. And they are less interested to understand if there's some subject in the water, then what's the PFAS concentration in those, in those stuff. Imagine if we're gonna use surface water for drinking water purposes, then those uh, foreign objects will be ex excluded out. So far, I don't think people have been using microalgae for decomposing things. It's just not the natural capacity. And like, for example, my lab, we're using algae for photosynthesis to capture carbon dioxide. 
But I can tell you some other study that that it was even long time ago. Um, also, as a collaboration with uh, with Dr. Joshua Wong, we find out actually find a pattern for this uh, technology. We can form a pellet when we have fungus together with algae together. So you know, algae grow as big mass in in the lakes. And then a fungi can grow by itself. But if we manipulate, then we can form a wonderful pellet. So what you ask is a very valid question. Can we utilize this pellet for bioremediation? Then uh, the way for dealing this pellet is much simpler than uh, you harness the biomass from algae, your centrifuge, right? It's just big mass. But now you have a pellet, you can use a screen, then you can just have the water go away. Then all your pellets, either it's a mixture of algae or fungus, then uh, whatever you have captured in these pellets will stay with you. So I think that can be synergized with what we're talking about, that uh, giving fungus the biomass, because algae is a plant, and it's, some algae are more like plants, some algae are cyanobacteria, so those are bacteria. But again, that mass can serve as a carbon source for the composers of fungi. So I hope this partially answers your question, that we can utilize algae in a way that it, it can be used as a vehicle to absorb potentially, but I don't think anybody has done that study currently in this field. Good idea. Sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Some good comments from Felipe. This talk was incredibly interesting and inspiring. I will be looking forward to seeing how your research continues to develop. And so maybe with that, um, I'm curious, so, you know, I know that the EPA and a lot of the federal agencies, this is like a big concern and there's probably a lot of funding. What are some of the sort of next steps when you do this type of research? Because um, I know you have a lot of different research projects going on, but um, once you publish a paper, like, is it a matter of um, like industry choosing to develop a solution around it? Um, what, what are kind of the next steps that you see? Yeah, that's a very good question. Don't get me wrong that I'm not thinking for that direction. So when uh, I presented earlier for that screening experiment, and that's actually a project I'm very excited about because what I hope is, I mentioned to you, I press lectures. We happen to choose a species because we know very well for this species. We have done a lot of study like 80 years ago. But I know that could be more powerful species or isolates can do a better job than IPRAX lactiers. And that's why we're screening at hundreds of the isolates. Hopefully we can get a one that's more tolerant with PFAS, that has a better capacity with PFAS. So wrapping is owning a vehicle. Now I have something here. I have PFAS in here. So fungus do the work. Then pick one that's more powerful. I think that's very important to answer this question. And then number two is we can think of ways to enhance the capacity. So what I'm saying is human beings are very impatient. Fungus mm -hmm. can take a very long time to grow, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't get those mushroom producers profitable if they have to grow the mushroom for, for one month, right? You, you agree with me? So in order to live in this commercialized, highly commercialized society, even for doing those remediation, people want things to be done. Like within this time period, the, fun, the Congress is going to say, well, in the, in the session time, that the Congress is going to say, you have two years to fix this problem. I'm not going to give you more funding. So the current reality is we have to move fast with those remediation projects, right? And then uh, what's really happening in the real world is you have this contaminated land, and a lot of them are only decomposed. People are not using them. So the idea is really, if this natural system can be can be sustained for, let's say, up to five years. That's probably going to do the work, but not meeting our standard, not meeting our human society expectations. So that's why I'm trying to combine different disciplines to improve this rate as a so-called efficiency for the system. Mm -hmm. And in, in the current short term of the study, we can detect some degraded products from the, the, the P4. And I see there's another question from Omar. Actually, that's a very good question. You are right in the researcher mind that what's the absorption 
versus the bio transformation? And it's a very hard question to answer because the, the tools we have now give a best answer of what has been removed, but they give less answer of what has been decomposed because it's very difficult to study and, and identify those decomposed products. For the parent, we know because we have available tool, we can measure the concentration. But once it's disappeared, where to find those destination is a much difficult question to answer. So I hope this also partially answer what Oma is talking uh, is asking. That our next phase is, of course, research. We hope to understand why that's happening, understand the mechanism of the fungi is decomposing. It's only by through understanding why it's doing the job that you can improve the function and the efficiency of doing that job. Together of understanding what's a degraded product, what's the toxicity as a product from their system. Mm -hmm. And um, another question somewhat related, like from start to finish, uh, when you began doing your research with USDA, looking at the different fungi, like what is the period of this research project? Uh, you mean our future plan or when we get it started? Uh, uh, when to, start, the end? started um, when you started until you were published this um, summer. Oh yeah, actually that uh, screening work while well, writing a manuscript to hope to publish uh, that paper um, by, by, by the summer of this year, 2023. But it's ongoing work because we publish as we go. But as long as we, um, we, I think it's more kind of determination of the library because once we establish this essay, then uh, it comes to what are the other isolates of the interest. So right now we have a handful of isolates of different functions and I'm very excited about that. And I have not even thought about how we're going to deal with it the slow decomposers, because that's another next phase of our collaboration. I want to talk with my collaborator. What are our thoughts? We know those are slow growers. How do we understand them? And maybe number one, the screening condition is not optimal. 30 degree is wonderful for a Texas fungus, <laughs> fungus but may not be ideal for Wisconsin fungus, you know? So there are a lot of things to be done in, in terms of our collaboration. I'm very excited about this collaboration to manage this. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely noticed there's some species in Central Texas that, that mm -hmm. you know, are very aggressive. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the, the uh, hexagonia hydnoids. That one is everywhere and it's fruits. I see it cycling like three or four times a year, mm -hmm. uh, just depending on how droughty or our conditions. But uh, that one, that one I always look at and I'm always thinking like, I hope someone's doing research on this one, but I know it's not as common. I think it's more tropical or so, a Southern, um, Southern fungus. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's something that's a big concern, I'm sure. Yes. Um, and this research that um, the USDA um, did to kind of look at all the decomposing, is that something they just do for the for just generally um, and have available to for other research projects? Or yeah, they have, that's also very good. I, I probably cannot speak to their mission, but again, they have this rich collection and actually people have done a lot to understand the decomposer capacity of those vital fungus in combination with the Department of Energy because uh, many, many uh, research efforts has been dedicated into lignin decompo decomposition Partially because it's a it's a huge waste. I mean, if you if you, you we drive on the Texas road and even in Iowa in Oklahoma, and we saw those like piles of those biomass, right? A lot of even when we offer the, the corn harvest, those like stems. So to be honest, those material produced are actually we went to <laughs> post the harvest. We get those like corn store and then we bring them to the lab and process with the cellulose and lignins. And uh, a huge biomass not really utilized. So I'm thinking people understand a lot for the fungal uh, decomposition capacity for lignin. And then uh, hopefully we can also harness that to use lignin as a substrate to produce valuable products. Okay, so we have a few more questions. So Omar, um, you're up next. Do you want to unmute? <coughs> 
Yes, um, I believe the question was partially answered already. That uh, that's uh, if I understood correctly, the response um, there is a that is the next uh, frontier, so to speak. How much is it actual adsorption versus how much is actual biodegradation? Yeah. Um, because I think that's where it's at. If it's just fixating the the PFAS, then that's useful to a certain point, but you still have to somehow dispose of that absorbed matter. But if you actually achieve significant amounts of biodegradation, biotransformation, you know, I, I think naturally that's where everybody would aim to go in this research. I hope I understood that response correctly. Yes, you're right on the money. And that's what I'm saying. We know it's a, a, an inefficient way compared with burning it up. Because if you burn it, I mean, next day it's gone. But again, it's more expensive, not sustainable. That's why we understand the eventual, the final destination we hope is the non-toxic degraded products. But nature takes a long time. Trust me, millions of years later, the forever chemicals will be gone. But we are not going to be leave that alone to say. That's why we want to harness the, the, the capacity, but improve it and enhance it to meet our expectations. Mm -hmm. So Winding Brook asked, um, and this is something that we've addressed, we've talked a little bit about too, but about the application. Um, and, um, you know, maybe. Yes, know, and I didn't, I didn't ask that question correctly. I was so excited. I typed a bunch of gibberish. I, I, I can actually type. Um, what I wanted to ask is like, are you seeing this to be used in industrial capacity? Yeah, in in our hypothesis, so in, in our planning, and you are exact, exactly right for the filter design. That's what we did in our experiment. So we packed it up in a filter and have the water go through it. Then in that flow setting, you can enrich uh, PFAS in, to remove it from the water. So, so like, that's, yeah, that's what I was saying. So like filters, mm -hmm. it could filter yeah. the yeah. water and remove that or on water an industrial plant. level. Yeah, that's, uh, but again, because my lab is on a, on a lab scale and for the system we're building, I don't have a picture for that. Actually, I probably should have included. So we have like a one liter bottle, then we have a, a normal like pipes you can buy from Home Depot and then you you you, you connect it up. But in the real industry setting, like if if people are testing this in a, in a drinking water facility, then they have to build a tanks, like large, large, large columns. And those are, Pretty expensive, I would like to say, because many of those current technology for drinking water treatment don't go through those ex very expensive tanks to remove certain group of chemicals. That's kind of uh, not as a current infrastructure support. Some more advanced plants will be able to do that, but most of the drinking water um, treatment plants will not do that. Right, but I, I really, that's a brilliant concept to, 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 to do the drinking water um, wow, that's impressive. I just, I'm very excited um, to have heard your talk and I want to say thank you very much. It's super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So Danielle Stevenson, do you want to? Yeah. Share? Thank you so much uh, for sharing your work. It's so great. Um, I sort of just building off of some of the like last question around the application. I guess mm -hmm. I'm curious what you might foresee as some of the challenges with applying this um, outside of the lab. And I guess something that comes to mind, like are you, have you seen in your lab scale studies or are you concerned about um, the production of toxic byproducts from any potential degradation? Since I know that some PFAS um degrade um <laughs> to to also just other types of toxic PFAS. Yeah. Wonderful question. That's one thing as Andrew asking my future research direction. So I'm trying to un understand what are the degraded products in this whole process. So I can share some experience with you that while trying very hard as a standard for the field, if we are studying PFAS degradation, 
The ultimate goal is if you can measure the free fluoride in the solution, which means you have mineralized your parent compound, right? If you imagine that a structure carbon fluorine, and if you cut it, cut it, cut it, and it break down, what's going to end up with? Fluoride. That's what your final destination is. And what's probably the least toxic compound, I mean, that compound element you can produce. So in our study, what we are trying very hard is to look into if we can detect uh, fluoride as a final product. And uh, um, as I mentioned, we have also other tools in the lab to help us to understand how we can decompose like PFAS. So I mentioned photocatalysis so right now, our lab have designed a material that can change or in a very short time, more faster than the fungus, but not as, as sustainable as the fungus, that it can change uh, C8 into C7 and C6 in a short period of time. But it needs different conditions. It's a totally different like research direction away from bioremediation. But what I hope is we can combine those things together. So you are exactly correct that we need to understand if the products are less toxic or more toxic or comparable toxic as the parent molecule. But one thing is, I think it's safe to say, but it has to be validated. Is people usually think the shorter PFAS molecule are less toxic than the longer PFAS molecules. It's kind of a, a belief and some evidence with certain groups. But again, given that many, many PFAS that has been manufactured to, to comprehensively characterize everything is very expensive. So that's kind of a general belief. If you get shorter, then it's less toxic. But I'm not saying they're no longer toxic. They're still toxic. It's just like to a lesser degree. Okay. Uh, Trish Phelps, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, I was wondering, um, the um, enzymes that break the carbon fluoride or carbon chloride bonds are very unusual. Are they more common in the fungal groups than they are in other microbial groups? That's actually a wonderful question. And I can tell you from literature that some of my colleagues actually have done this work. I will give you one enzyme, the lacase. People have studied that which they have just purchased the enzyme from the vendor, and then they treat PFAS with, with lacase, which shows lacase can decompose um, PFAS. And the problem is that is actual lacase is, is a fungal uh, enzyme that uh, the commercial enzyme we can buy, like lacase is, is purified from actually Tremtase vesicle. <laughs> I want to be honest with you. That's very expensive because, and another collaborator of mine trying to repeat that experiment, then um, this is largely dependent on the, on the activation form of the lacase. So, so far, I don't think that lab has the luck to, to source a reliable uh, commercial lacase to the job, but people have shown that enzymes and some other like um, Rodox enzymes in a purified form can do the, can do the work but just too expensive. So if you think of buying a protein or you purify a protein of your own work compared to just growing a fungus, apparently the second approach is more cost-effective and amenable to, to different hands. Protein work is, is much harder, especially for pure enzyme work. It's purification, number one, is a barrier. Number two, to make sure your bioenzyme or biocatalyst is active in the conditions you have for your treatment is another very tough um, and uh, very delicate uh, skill people have to apply. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see, Nicole. Thank you. Uh, Yes, so Nicole, do you want to ask your question? Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I was just wondering, because I've been doing a little bit of research on remediation, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the current technology is, but I was thinking if we can figure out which enzymes the fungi produce, if we could just recreate them and imply the 
apply them to different research uh, or project areas, like with a backpack sprayer or something. Um, and if that wouldn't help us in some way. Yeah, that's exactly uh, uh, Trish has mentioned, and I agree with both of you. Um, I our hypothesis: Who is doing the job? Yes, fun, fungus. Fungus is an organism. That's the big guy, the big brother. But who is doing the the, the little work? Enzymes. And my hypothesis is actually because it's not only one protein; it's not only one enzyme from one fungus. This particular fungus, like ours. We produce different enzymes doing different work in our body. Then it's a network of enzymes that doing those work simultaneously. So maybe there's this enzyme did this part of the job. Then there's another com enzyme come in, then continue the work together. And uh, uh, ideally, if we can separate and purify and express those protein, that's in E. coli, they can do the work. That's what I, I mentioned. That case is a wonderful example. And uh, um, that biochemistry can be combined. If it's inexpensive, it's easy to do. But work on the protein need a lot of very uh, specialized skills. Because I, I can I train undergraduate students in my lab. So everybody come to my lab. I love undergraduate students. The first thing is go and grow a plate. And make sure your plate is not contaminated. Imagine we have hundreds of isolates in the lab. So typically in the first round of the training, this undergraduate student will have contaminated plates, but typically they get better and better. But if I ask the undergraduate student to, to express a protein, especially a pure protein can do this work, it's almost impossible. Okay, so Angie asks about what agar recipe she must cultivate mushrooms too. <laughs> what <laughs> bigger recipe <laughs> do you use for your work? Yeah, I, I, I can share with you. That's a very common like, agar recipe I, I do uh, in, in my lab. But if you want to really grow a mushroom, I think work with Angie to get those composite mulch will be a better solution to go. <laughs> those are kind of for, for isolates. So we inoculate and they will not grow into a mushroom shape. And even though for many of those like fungus, my collaborator has collected in the field. They are real mushrooms, right? But then uh, what do we do now in the lab? We don't say mushrooms. We say all those like mycelium and liquid culture. So I can I can share that that plate recipe. It's a very common uh, recipe that uh, very easy to make, to repeat. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Bobby, do you want to ask your question? Is that the is that my name that asked about wood chips? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, I guess I have two questions. One is when you compared the uh, material that you came up with to <laughs> uh, other controls, did you, what did you all compare it to and how absorbed, like if I just, I'm just wondering common wood chips, mm -hmm. um, something like wine cap or King's Jeferia or other aggressive <laughs> wood lovers. Um, if a simpler process for us at home, mm -hmm. um, that kind of media could just absorb it and then grow the fungi right on top of that. Or even, um, for instance, mm -hmm. I noticed a uh, lion's mane mushroom one of the species I have really turns the blue agar plates completely green mm -hmm. and it has a lot of color degrading property. Um, and then combining like uh, phytoremediation, like growing trees in a contaminated area like beach or something mm -hmm. um, with the intention of then growing that mushroom either on logs or if it's a wood lover um, on the chip. Yeah, Sorry for I, that I, rambling kind of idea. Those are, I think, a wonderful features if those wood chips can do the job. But unfortunately, I don't think they can. What we compare uh, in, in the control experiment, of course, we compare with uh, um, other plant components. That's why if I go back to the figure, there's many things on the bottom. They don't even absorb. And then uh, in the field, in the PFAS that like treat in the field, people use active carbon a lot. So if you compare with common wood chips with active carbon, you immediately see the difference, right? Because active oh, so carbon. Have, 
like biochar basically mixed with wood chips um biochar has many many like formats it has to be engineered biochar like special designed because the okay. the mechanism for for biochar or active carbon is a large surface area and then uh, in our design of the the material we compare our surface area with active carbon ours is a foam it is not as comparable with active carbon so the chemistry behind it is in, more important. That's why I show that a colorful purple, yellow, bluish overlaying of different elements. Because we incorporate a functional group onto lignin. That's the functional group that catch up PFAS. Instead what of the carbon by physical resorption. What chemical group is that? The amine group. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Thank you so much for that insight. Yeah, very good uh, idea, and 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 I think in 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 reality we have to come up with things as inexpensive as wood chips to do the job. So you think it's still worthwhile, and will um, at least clean up whatever it is um, faster than just letting them decompose on their own. That's the idea behind this uh, this like a uh, wrapping uh, concept. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, um, I have a few more questions and then uh, we'll uh, say good night. Um, what uh, plant, I, I was kind of looking through your documentation, mm -hmm. but uh, what plant was the design of the sponge based on? Conestover, that's what I, I, I think I probably don't have this in this presentation. But we collect those corn stove in 2021. <laughs> we collected a lot of it. So we are using that corn stove to produce lignin and cellulose. Then we further engineer uh, from cellulose to that fibril. And then uh, the lignin to the lignin powder, then we fabricate that together. <laughs> okay, so you said the corn silks? Corn, yes, after harvest. That's so harvest. pretty. I love that so much. Yes, um, and there's... Yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing too, because that's something that's um, you know, there's so much of that already being grown and yeah. for different things. Um, so the last question I have when I learned about your research and uh, you know, was looking at all of the things happening around uh, finding solutions for this, I also saw that um, there were some uh, other labs and people looking at using ultraviolet light. Is that something you can speak on maybe just briefly or um, is that something maybe you're looking at too or um, is that something that has already been tried and it's you know not yeah. as effective or too expensive? Exactly, that's why I mentioned a photocatalysis. And I know there are other people using, using light as a driving force to decompose PFAS and other things. And that has to combine with some material that's a photoactive, which means you still have a, have a media that it can absorb the light and then do the work for you. The light itself won't decompose PFAS. There's no way if PFAS can be decomposed by light, then all those treatment plants will just have and the sun, sun to do the, 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 the job. So compare with the cost, I don't think that's on the commercialization stage as well. And if you think of the of the material composition, then typically those are kind of metal-based, like catalyst. So it can, at the same time, absorb the light, then release the energy to attack the PFAS molecule. So it's different mechanism. Uh, at this time, there's no commercial platform. So it's hard to say which one is cheaper, which one's more expensive. But in my ultimate like, belief, I think the bioremediation will be the cheapest like solution to R compared with anything you have to create. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one last question from Nicole. Sorry, I feel like such a pest. Um, yeah. <laughs> super, super interested in remediation. Um, I've got a background in wildfire mitigation. And one thing that I was always talking to, um, like homeowners and just various supervisors about was what we can do with all of our forest material. Cause a lot of times, depending on certain properties and how overgrown they are, you're like, cool. Now we've got like six inches of wood chips and you're going to cook your property if it catches on fire. Um, and I was originally looking at grad schools and, trying to find a way to either do activated charcoal or biochar or something and try and find 
better uses for all of that. Otherwise, like out in Montana, we would just build like these six by six pyres and just light them on fire. And I'm like, cool, we're still mm -hmm. all of that into the atmosphere. But if we could get local agencies to create their own activated carbon out of it and then ship it to remediation sites closer to them, if maybe that would be another option just to start soaking up these chemicals. Yeah, that's actually, I think a lot of active carbon probably manufacturing the way, you are right. Actually, logistics plays a large role in the technical economic analysis for anything that's going to be produced. Because a lot of active carbon or biochar are really sourced from the, those biomass. I think the problem is we have more forests or other biomass we can handle, like the, the paper, the paper manufacturing industry the paper mills right they produce a lot of those like biomass waste but those are just waste and uh, i don't think that that large capacity I mean, need to create active carbon from those biomass does that make sense to you or basically if there is a manufacturer of active carbon they must have used the lowest cost to source the biomass they need to get instead of uh, what we're talking about here a lot of logistics issues Mm -hmm. Right. Well, lots of great questions and discussion tonight. We appreciate you, uh, Dr. Dow, uh, from for spending time with us this evening. And if uh, there's no other questions, we'll say good night to everyone and uh, happy Lunar New Year. To all the lunar kings, queens, everybody in between. Uh, but yeah, so celebrate this weekend, everyone. And we will see everyone next time. Hopefully see you at the Mushroom Block giveaway um, or our upcoming cultivation classes. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Very nice to meet everybody. Good night. Thank you.